Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir. I am an assistant professor at the Jindal Global Law School. Welcome to the EPG Patshala. Today, we'll be looking at Paper 4, Civil and Political Rights, and Module 15, The Right to Fair Trial under the Constitution of India, Part 1. This module will introduce the student to two articles, namely Article 20 and Article 22 of the Constitution of India that form the very bedrock of the right to a fair trial. The module will first explore Article 20, Clause 1, which deals with ex post facto laws, followed by Article 20, Clause 2, which deals with the principle of double jeopardy. And finally, Article 20, Clause 3, which speaks of the prohibition against self-incrimination. The module will also briefly discuss the protections against arrest and detention in certain cases set out in Article 22. The purpose of this module is twofold. First, the module aims to give the students an overview of the constitutionally recognized components of an individual's right to a fair trial. And secondly, the module aims to help the students understand the manner in which the scope of the right to a fair trial has been expanded by judicial interpretation. Now let's start with Article 20, Clause 1. Article 20, Clause 1 of the Constitution of India states, No person shall be convicted of any offence except for violation of a law in force at the time of the commission of the act charged as an offence, nor be subjected to a penalty greater than that which might have been inflicted under the law in force at the time of the commission of the offence. We're going to look at now the Delhi gang rape case. In the Delhi gang rape case, Nirbhaya, as she's now come to be known, the victim, was raped by five individuals, four of whom were adults and one was a juvenile. In the aftermath of the rape, there were protests nationwide, with posters being carried out, with posters being carried around saying, hang the rapist. While Nirbhaya was hanging on for life, the rapists were identified and arrested. However, the police waited to file an FIR and charge them. The, the police waited to charge them. The reason was this. As Nirbhaya was battling for her life, the only offence for which the police could have charged the accused was gang rape. The maximum punishment for gang rape at that time was not death. And the majority of the country's citizens, the people in the nation, wanted death for the rapists. But you could not get death for the rapists. Why? Because of Article 20, Clause 1. Article 20, Clause 1 states, No person shall be convicted of any offence except for violation of a law in force at the time of the commission of the act charged as an offence, nor be subjected to a penalty greater than that which had been inflicted under the law in force at the time of the commission of the offence. So, what does that have to do with the Nirbhaya case? Very simple. The maximum punishment at that time was not death. Therefore, you could not inflict death. Now, post the criminal law amendments in 2013, raping somebody and leaving them in a permanent vegetative state can attract the death penalty in India. In any event, Nirbhaya unfortunately passed away and the rapist was subsequently charged with murder, convicted and have now been sentenced to, the, and have now been sentenced to death. Protection under this article applies only to criminal cases. The protection con contemplated under this article is twofold. A. Protection from punishment under any law that was not enforced during the time of commission of the offence. Protection from punishment under any law that was not enforced during the time of the commission of offence. So, let's assume that Nirbhaya actually did not die and she remained in a permanent vegetative state. The question is, could those four out of the five who were adults and or could they essentially be tried under the new offense of raping somebody and leaving them in a permanent vegetative state? The answer is no. Because raping somebody and leaving them in a vegetative state, that particular definition, that offense, leaving somebody in a vegetative state was only added after the Nirbhaya gang rape case and therefore was an ex post facto law. It was post the act of the gang rape, basically, and those men were protected from Article 20, from being tried for raping somebody and leaving them in a permanent vegetative state. And obviously, that issue is now moot because Nirbhaya passed away and they were anyway tried, or, tried and convicted of murder. The second protection is 
there can be no increase in the penalty for an offense essentially it cannot be retrospectively applied essentially if the punishment for an offense was life at the time it was committed it cannot be increased to death at the time of conviction and sentencing because at the time the offense was committed the maximum punishment was life a very simple concept here you're looking at a picture of the protests after the 2012 delhi gang rape case and the protesters clearly outraged but oblivious to article 20 of the constitution of india now we come to the landmark case of shiv bahadur singh in shiv bahadur singh two government officials of the erstwhile state of vindhya pradesh were accused of taking a bribe for carrying out an official act and for the commission of forgery in connection with such acts they were charged under the relevant provisions of the ipc the indian penal court which were adopted in the erstwhile state of vindhya pradesh by means of an executive ordinance this was around the time india had just got independence therefore the machinery was still not in place so by means of an executive ordinance the state of vindhya pradesh uh, implemented the relevant provisions of the indian penal code the ordinance was passed on 11 september 1949 while the offenses themselves were said to have been committed in the months of february march and april 1949 that's the months prior to the ordinance implementing the provisions of the ipc so the question is can they be convicted of offenses under the ipc even though the ipc was implemented in the state by means of an executive ordinance a few months after the offense was committed the appellants in this that case obviously argued that the convictions were in respect of an ex post facto law creating offenses after the commission of the acts taking the bribe charged as such offenses and was hence unconstitutional in rao vadir singh the court considered the question of the proper construction of article 20 of the constitution and this is what they held and i quote what is prohibited is the conviction of a person or his subjection to a penalty under ex post facto laws the prohibition under the article is not confined to the passing or the validity of the law but extends to the conviction or the sentence and is based on its character as an ex post facto law the fullest effect must therefore be given to the actual words used in the article close quote what they're trying to say is the prohibition is not confined to the passing or the validity of the law itself right it extends to the conviction or the sentence and it's based on its character as an ex post facto law so what was the finding in rao bahadur singh the court held that the right under article 20 clause 1 does not apply to retrospective application of change in the procedure of the trial what does that mean in this context and i quote it is necessary to notice that what is prohibited under article 20 is only conviction or sentence under an ex post facto law and not the trial thereof such trial under a procedure different from what obtained at the time of the commission of the offense or by a court different from that which had competence at the time cannot ipso facto by matter of fact itself by that fact itself be held to be unconstitutional a person accused of the commission of an offense has no fundamental right to trial by a particular court or by a particular procedure except in so far as any constitutional objection by way of discrimination or the violation of any other fundamental right may be involved what does this mean it's very simple ex post facto laws apply to two things only they apply to the conviction and they apply to the sentence you cannot be convicted of a crime that was not a crime when you committed that act you cannot be sentenced to or you cannot be awarded a punishment that is greater than the punishment that was the maximum available on the statute books at the time of the commission of the offense ex post facto laws do not apply to procedure what does that mean if a law is passed with retrospective application altering the procedure of rape trials that protection of ex post facto laws does not extend to procedure it only extends to the substantive law the substantive law in the sense that the elements that make up the offense must have occurred 
when the law made that an offense. Rape of a woman, leaving her in a permanent vegetative state. That is substantive. The elements there are twofold. There must be rape, i.e. no consent. And the consequence of the rape is that the victim is in a vegetative state. If both of these elements are satisfied, yes, if both of these elements, so rape without, that is no consent, and the victim in a vegetative state, a consequence of the rape, are satisfied, then the offense is made out. But if both of these elements are satisfied, and but they were satisfied at a time when raping somebody and leaving them in a vegetative state was not an offense, then the ex post facto law protection applies. But the ex post facto law protection does not apply if raping somebody in a vegetative state, the offense takes place when it is an offense under the law and the procedure is altered. Ex post facto law does not apply to the trial procedure. It only applies to the conviction and the punishment. I hope that clarifies things. Now let's come to the other important case in this respect, Kedarnath Bajoria v. West Bengal. In Kedarnath Bajoria, the defendant Chatterjee committed an offence under the Prevention of Corruption Act 1947, which then prescribed a punishment of imprisonment or fine or both. In 1949, by an amendment, the punishment was enhanced. Chatterjee was fined 50,000 rupees from the government as compensation for damages that he falsely claimed the government inflicted on his property. He made a false claim against the government, a false claim against the government that they had inflicted damage on his property. Chatterjee claimed that the rupees 50,000 fine violated Article 21 of the Constitution because in 1947, the relevant criminal law only allowed for a fine equal to the amount of money the accused obtained for the commission of the crime. So essentially, essentially what happened was that Chatterjee was fined 50,000 rupees, but he accepted 47,000 rupees, 550 from the government as compensation for the damage that he falsely claimed was caused by the government to his property. By charging him 50, fining him 50,000 rupees, which is more than 47,550, the uh, Chatterjee claimed that that violated Article 20, Clause 1. However, at the time of his trial in 1950, the relevant statute enacted in 1949 allowed for increased fines. The court agreed with Chatterjee's claim and set aside the excess fine. The Supreme Court held that the enhanced punishment would not be applicable to the offence committed in 1947 because of the prohibition contained in Article 20, Clause 1. Basically, what the court said was this. You commit an offence. The punishment for that offence is 10 rupees on June 1st, 2015. You are convicted on July 1st, 2015 and you are asked to pay a fine of 15 rupees because between June 1st and July 1st, between you are committing the offence and you are being convicted, the law was amended to increase the fine from 10 rupees to 15 rupees. The maximum fine you can pay is 10 rupees, not 15 rupees. Because if you are asked to pay 15 rupees, that is an ex post facto law and that is unconstitutional. It's a violation of Article 20, Clause 1. Now we come to Article 20, Clause 2, the principle of double jeopardy. The principle of double jeopardy is safeguarded under Article 20, Clause 2 of the Constitution, which prohibits prosecuting or punishing a person for the same offence more than once. What does that mean? Let's look at the Supreme Court's analysis in Makbul Hussain, v. State of Bombay. And I quote, Article 20, Clause 2 incorporates within its scope the plea of Otrefa acquit as known to British jurisprudence or the plea of double jeopardy as known to the American constitution but circumscribed it by providing that there should be not only a prosecution but also a punishment in the first instance in order to operate as a bar to a second prosecution and punishment for the same offence. So what is the Supreme Court trying to say here? What they are basically trying to say is that there should be not only a prosecution but also in the a punishment in the first instance in order to operate as a bar to a second prosecution and punishment for the same offence. So let us say Salman Khan is tried for slapping Shah Rukh Khan, he is tried for assault. Essentially there is a trial but midway through the trial Salman Khan is discharged. What does that mean? There has been no acquittal, there has been no conviction. Can Salman Khan be tried again? 
for assault? The answer is yes, he can. Because Salman was not acquitted or convicted in the first case. If he was acquitted, he cannot be tried again. If he was convicted, he cannot be tried again for the same offense based on the same facts. Let's look at another quote from the same case and then I'll give you another illustration. The words before a court of law or judicial tribunal, sir, Supreme Court says, are not to be found in Article 20, Clause 2. But if regard be had to the whole background indicated above, it is clear that in order that the protection of Article 20, Clause 2 be invoked by a citizen, there must have been a prosecution and punishment in respect to the same offence before a court of law or a tribunal required by law to decide the matters in controversy judicially on evidence on oath, which it must be authorized by law to administer and not before a tribunal which entertains a departmental or administrative inquiry even though set up by statute but not required to proceed on legal evidence given on oath. That's a long quote and a lot of information, so let's break it down again. This was exactly what happened in the case of Makbul Hussain versus State of Bombay. In the case of Makbul Hussain, the accused was found in possession of undeclared gold and the customs authorities thereupon took action under the Sea Customs Act and confiscated the gold. The owner of the gold was however given the option to pay in lieu of such confiscation a fine of rupees 12,000, which option was to be exercised within four months of the date of the order. Nobody came forward to redeem the gold. Later, a complaint was filed in the court of the Chief Presidency Magistrate, Bombay, and against the appellant charging him with having committed an offence under Section 8 of FEMA, uh, FIRA, the Foreign Exchange uh, Regulation Act, basically. So, he was charged with com committing a foreign exchange violation, having already undergone proceedings before the customs authorities. The question that arose in Makbul Hussain before the court was whether, by reason of the proceedings taken by the sea customs authorities, the appellant was already prosecuted and punished for the same offence with which he was charged in the court of the Chief Presidency Magistrate, Bombay. The court held emphatically that the Sea Customs Authorities were not a judicial tribunal and the Sea Customs Act does not constitute a judgment or an order of a court or judicial tribunal necessary for the purpose of supporting a plea of double jeopardy. Again, it was merely administrative in nature not judicial. Customs authorities do not have the power to take evidence or not. They do not have the power to send somebody to prison, essentially. They imposed a fine. They essentially, they essentially imposed a fine, right, of rupees 12,000 under the Sea Customs Act and they confiscated the gold. That's all they did. They did not deprive uh, the appellant of his or her, oh, sorry, of his liberty. So essentially the court held that he could subsequently be tried by the Chief Presidency Magistrate in Bombay. And therefore, when the customs authorities confiscated the gold in question, neither proceedings taken with neither the proceedings taken before the Sea Customs Authorities constituted a prosecution of the appellant, nor did the order of confiscation constitute a punishment inflicted by a court or judicial tribunal in the appellant. By now, all of this should be amply clear to you. So quickly. The Code of Criminal Procedure, Section 300, extends the protection to persons acquitted by a court. Article 20, Clause 2 does not talk about uh, proceedings before a court of law or a judicial tribunal. However, the Supreme Court has held this to be implicit in Article 20, Clause 2. They say, look at the whole background. If you want the protection of Otrefa acquit, Otrefa convict, double jeopardy, call it what you want. There must have been a prosecution and punishment in respect of the same offence before a court of law. It has to be a court of law or a tribunal. So we all know what a court of law is. What is a court of law? A court of law is a body that is required by statute to decide the matters in controversy judicially. So what is the meaning of judicially? They must take oath. They must take, sorry, they must take evidence on oath. Evidence must be given on oath. That is key. To proceeding being judicial in nature. Principles of natural justice must, be, must, must apply to those proceedings. It must be authorized by law to administer the oath. But a tribunal which simply entertains a departmental or administrative inquiry, even though set up by a statute but not required to proceed on legal evidence given on oath, is not a legal body. Simply having an internal inquiry is not a legal body. So let us say an employee of the government an employee of the government, there is a departmental inquiry because he has essentially assaulted his superior. 
he assaults his superior, there is a departmental inquiry, he is employment is terminated. He cannot claim the protection of Article 20 Clause 2, he cannot claim the protection of double jeopardy when that superior files a complaint in the police station, they register an FIR against him for assault. They ca cannot do that. They cannot do that. Why? That he cannot claim that protection. Why? Because the departmental inquiry was not a legal body. It wasn't a... It, that dispute was... Rather, the uh, adjudication was not judicial in nature. There was no evidence on oath. The principles of natural justice perhaps were followed. But it was not authorized by law to essentially administer an oath. It was simply a departmental inquiry. It was administrative in nature. The maximum sanction that could be imposed was the employee could be terminated for slapping his boss. What is the maximum sanction before a court of law? He can be sent to prison, right? And if he is acquitted of slapping his boss or convicted, if he is acquitted or convicted, then he cannot be acquitted or convicted again. And he cannot claim that he cannot be tried in the first place because the departmental inquiry already did so. The department inquiry was not a judicial body. It was not a court of law or a judicial tribunal. And the protection of Article 20 Clause 2 does not apply to such bodies when you are, uh, when there is a decision that is adverse to your interest that is taken by them. Therefore, Section 300 states that a person acquitted or convicted by a competent court may not be tried again for the same offence, thereby giving effect to the principle of autrefa acquit and autrefa convict. Here you see a poster of the film Double Jeopardy, somewhat of a cult hit in the 1990s, which dealt with the story of a woman who essentially is convicted of murdering her husband and actually finds out that her husband framed her for the murder and was very much alive while she was serving her sentence. So what does she do? She essentially escapes from prison and actually I'll leave the rest for you to go and watch the film and I don't want to ruin the ending for you, but it does deal with double jeopardy. So do watch it. Film stars Tommy Lee Jones. So Article 20, Clause 3. Article 20, Clause 3 embodies the principle of protection against self-incrimination. Under this article, no person accused of an offence can be compelled to be a witness against himself. One could say that this is one of the most important protections uh, in any democratic society, the right against self-incrimination. The United States, often in movies, you will see them uh, saying, I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. What do they mean by I plead the fifth? What they mean by I plead the fifth is I plead the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment in the United States Constitution uh, essentially protects the citizens of the United States from self-incrimination. In the case of M.P. Sharma versus Satish Chandra, the court upheld a very broad understanding of the phrase to be a witness and held it to include any documentary evidence given by any person which might be self-incriminated. The Constitution only deals with persons convicted. But Section 300 essentially extends it to persons also acquitted by a court. You can say that's also constitutionally mandated, a broader reading, it's implicit. Section 300 simply states that a person acquitted or convicted by a competent court, a competent court, remember, a competent court. What does a competent court mean? It's very simple. Can a person convicted of rape by a magistrate's court claim the protection of autrefa convict? The answer is no, because a magistrate's court is not competent to try cases of rape. Cases of rape must be tried by a sessions judge, by a court of sessions. Therefore, the magistrate's court is not competent. So whether the magistrate's court convicts or acquits that individual of committing rape is immaterial. He will be tried in a court of sessions. And the plea of autre for acquit and convict cannot be invoked by him. So instead of Bombay versus Katikalu, while considering the admissibility of handwriting samples and fingerprints as against the protection from self-incrimination, they confined the meaning of the phrase to be a witness. In that case, they confined the phrase to be a witness. They held to be a witness means imparting knowledge in respect of relevant fact by means of oral statements or statements in writing by a person who has personal knowledge of the facts to be communicated to a court or to a person holding an inquiry or investigation. What does that mean? Essentially, right? They restricted the phrase to be a witness. They restricted, gave it a restricted meaning, a restrictive interpretation, restricting it to imparting knowledge orally or in writing. Right? So what about handwriting samples? The court held that to be hit by Article 20, Clause 3, the testimony of the witness should be self-incriminatory by itself. So 
simply put if you give a handwriting sample and that matches to a note at the scene of the crime does that mean it's self incriminatory by itself no the prosecution still has to prove you committed the murder simply finding a note matching your handwriting is not of itself self incriminatory is it well here's what the supreme court said and i quote in order that a testimony by an accused person may be said to have been self incriminatory the compulsion of which comes within the prohibition of article 20 clause 3 it must be of such a character that by itself by itself it should have the tendency of incriminating the accused if not also of actually doing so therefore the court held the admission of handwriting samples and fingerprints were permissible you cannot refuse to give fingerprints saying it will incriminate you because giving a fingerprint of itself does not mean you incriminate yourself essentially so therefore in that case the court held the admission of handwriting samples and fingerprints but a warning here in these scenarios especially in matters of the intersection between criminal and constitutional law it's always a case by case basis you have to look at it on a case by case basis to see if that evidence that you are asking the accused to provide is incriminatory by itself it has the tendency of incriminating the accused the tendency of incriminating the accused if not of actually doing so now we come to the landmark judgment of selvi versus state of karnataka the supreme court in selvi versus state of karnataka while considering the constitutional validity of lie detector tests held that the compulsory and i quote the compulsory administration of the impugn techniques violates the right against self incrimination this is because the underlying rationale of the said right is to ensure the real, real, reliability as well as voluntariness of statements that are admitted as evidence reliability voluntariness two requirements right the court also stated that an i court forcing an individual to undergo any of the impugn techniques lie detector narco analysis narco analysis where essentially you are not in control of what you are saying through various chemical substances your a state of a medical condition is inst- uh, induced whereby you don't really have control over what you're saying and is popularly known as the truth serum for example right the court held that forcing an under, uh, an individual to undergo any of those tests or techniques violates the standard of substantive due process what is substantive due process substantive due process is due process that is just fair and reasonable is it just fair and reasonable to inject somebody with a liquid give them a medication or use some sort of device uh, on them whereby they don't have control over what they are saying that's the question and the supreme court said that it is not fair it violates the standard of substantive due process which is required for restraining personal liberty So the court said such a violation will occur irrespective of whether these techniques are forcibly administered during the course of investigation or for any other purposes since that for any other purpose since the test results could also expose a person to adverse consequences of a non penal nature what does that mean essentially when you forcibly inject somebody with a, a a truth serum for example what does that mean the consequences are not simply of a penal nature they are also of a non penal nature there could be medical consequences how can you forcibly administer such drugs to people it goes against the very grain of our constitution was what the supreme court held in selvi versus state of karnataka here the court further held and i quote the protective scope of the right against self incrimination extends to the investigative stage in criminal cases and when read with section 161 of the code of criminal procedure it protects accused persons suspects as well as witnesses who are examined during an investigation so let us say that a note is left at the scene of the crime by the accused uh, and the accused they ask the accused for a handwriting sample they ask the accused for a handwriting sample so that they can match the handwriting can the accused be compelled to give that handwriting sample that is the question of the constitution here you see a graphic representation of how the police despite clear directions from the supreme court in selvi versus state of karnataka conduct these tests forcibly in many instances now we come finally to the nandini satpati case nandini satpati a former chief minister of orissa was accused of embezzling funds while serving as chief minister of orissa she appeared before the deputy superintendent of police dsp vigilance and provided answers to written questions she refused to answer the questionnaire 
on grounds that it was a violation of a fundamental right against self incrimination and she was charged under section 179 of the ipc 1860 which prescribes a punishment for refusing to answer any questions asked by a public servant authorized to ask that question So here was the issue. Nandini said, "Party." Nandini said, "Party." Said, "No, I will not answer this question because if this, if I answer this question, I open up myself to possible penal consequences." The issue before the Supreme Court in Sat Party was whether Ms. Sat Party, Ms. Sat Party, had a right to silence and whether people can refuse to answer all questions during investigation that would point towards guilt. The Supreme Court held that Ms. Sat Party had to answer all questions that did not. and pay attention materially incriminate her materially incriminate her for question she refused to answer she was required to provide without disclosing details her reason for fearing that answering such questions would result in self incrimination okay i will not answer this question the police will ask you if they you are uh, being examined under section 161 uh, subsection 2 of the code of criminal procedure okay why don't you want to answer this question well i don't want to answer this question because it will self incriminate me that's not sufficient you have to actually have to articulate the reasons for fearing that it would result in self incrimination you have to give this police something more than oh i would incriminate myself that's not sufficient basically so once mrs satpati would basically give her reasons those reasons for her invoking her right to remain silent would then be examined and she would be liable for prosecution under section 179 of the ipc if it was determined that she refused to answer a question under the false pretense of self incrimination so it was just a false pretense of self incrimination she was simply not cooperating then you can try her under section 179 of the ipc in sat party the supreme court accepted that there is a prevalent tension between social interest in crime detection and the constitutional rights of an accused person however the protection of fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution is of utmost importance and in the interest of protecting these rights the supreme court said we the supreme court cannot write off fear of police torture leading to forced self incrimination so it's always a balancing act when it comes to criminal law and the constitution So quickly to wrap up, we look at Article Twenty Two, Clauses One and Two. They confer four rights upon a person who has been arrested. This is the preventive detention provision of the Constitution. It was essentially put in there because a lot of the framers of India's Constitution were afraid of the overarching power given to the state under Article Twenty One, which simply said a person could be deprived of their life or liberty as long as that deprivation was according to the procedure established by law. so therefore they set in place certain restrictions as far as detention of persons was concerned so what are those four rights under article 22 first a person cannot be detained in custody without a reason you must give somebody a reason for why they are being detained secondly they have the right to be represented by a lawyer of their choice they have the right to legal representation thirdly they have the right to be produced before a magistrate within 24 hours of arrest the old latin maxim habeas corpus you shall produce the body within 24 hours of arrest fourthly they cannot be detained in custody beyond the 24 hours without the detention being sanctioned by the competent court so you have to produce them before a magistrate you cannot just produce them before uh, the minister of law and justice for example it has to be a competent In Joginder Kumar was a state of UP. The Supreme Court emphasized that the police should exercise restraints while making arrests. And the, although this is strictly in the domain of the rights of arrested persons, it is also somewhat linked to the right to a fair trial. Essentially, you witnessed a crime. Let us say that you are a drug addict. You were buying cocaine or heroin or any other narcotic substance from your drug dealer. when you are buying the substance from your drug drug dealer you witness a hit and run case you witness a case whereby let us say a famous celebrity runs people over does not stop that celebrity is charged with culpable homicide the police want to call you at trial to testify you refuse to do so you refuse to answer the question what were you doing at so and so place because if you answer that i was buying cocaine i was buying heroin then you are guilty of offences under the ndps act essentially and you are incriminating yourself the, therefore the protective scope extends to investigative stage in the criminal proceedings as well as protects witnesses in trials who witnesses 
who are not the accused. So the Supreme Court held emphatically in Selvi versus State of Karnataka, test results from narco analysis, etc., cannot be admitted in evidence if they have been obtained through the use of compulsion. Now, a very common misunderstanding of Selvi is this that the court banned narco analysis test once and for all. That is wrong. All the court did in Selvi versus State of Karnataka was said was this. They said, you cannot have compulsion. If the individual says, look, I have nothing to hide, go ahead, conduct whatever tests you want to conduct. I'm happy to let you conduct it as long as that consent is free and full and informed. It's, it must be free, it must be informed consent. Informed consent meaning, informed consent basically meaning that that person must be fully notified of all the adverse consequences, both of a penal and a non-penal nature, of that test being carried out on him or her. So, as long as there's consent, it's constitutional. If there is no consent, it's unconstitutional. Upholding the right to remain silent even, Selvi guaranteed that forcible conveyance of personal knowledge that is relevant to the facts in issue violates Article 20, Clause 3. So, now we conclude. This module has dealt with three cardinal principles, ex post facto laws, double jeopardy, and the right to self-incrimination. In India, the burden of proof is always, and remember, is always on the prosecution. Article 20 essentially gives effect to this principle and puts in place safeguards such as double jeopardy to prevent the state from repeatedly trying individuals for the same offense. Hey, we didn't get him this time, we'll try again next, basically. That cannot be done. Article 20 also prohibits citizens, sorry, protects citizens rather, from being witnesses against themselves, with the onus being on the state to prove that they are guilty of the offence charged. These principles, as we've demonstrated in this module, form the very bedrock of India's criminal justice system and ensure that the citizen's right to a fair trial is guaranteed.